Sick Boy Wolfgang Productions presents The Offering with Jerry Horror. A deep dive into the history of film and its filmmakers. Mostly horror, always genre. Where can I get my pickles when I can't get to a farmer's market or festival? The answer is Pickle Island in Bayville, New York. Listen, I've been selling a small pickle my whole life. I know all about it. From the vine to the brine, they keep their pickles cold with a delicious, diverse selection of gourmet pickles, including their savory classic bread and butter sweet chip, horseradish pickle, jalapeno pickle, and sweet Cajun pickle. They even got pickled beets and okra, a variety of sour treats for your next barbecue or get-together. But if you visit their store in Bayville, Long Island, New York, there's so much more, so much more. A fantastic selection of physical media, comics, music, movies, VHS, and Matt Roran, their enthusiastic pickle salesman. It's kind of a big deal. Check them out now at hormansbestpickles.com. Hey, quit jerking your gherkin and head over to Pickle Island in Bayville, New York. Welcome to The Offering with Jerry Hara, the show where we can have a quiet and frank discussion as adults about the things that matter to me, or at least that I think matter to me. Please take a moment to subscribe to our show wherever you get fine podcasts, and hey, stay up to date on future episodes. This week on The Offering, we're talking all about the secret war that raged on behind the scenes, Hasbro versus Mattel, but more importantly, G.I. Joe versus Masters of the Universe. And don't forget, knowing is half the battle, because I have the power. Oh boy, ladies and gentlemen, it's your old pal Jerry Hara. It has been a crazy week. So excited. You know, right now we are uh, in the middle of summer. It's such an exciting time of year. All the big summer blockbusters are coming out. There's nothing better than a good summer blockbuster. I, I don't care what people say. I like big, dumb movies. I want explosions, maybe some monsters. I like a big, dumb movie. I got to tell you, though, I took some edibles. Okay. All right. Look, full disclosure, folks, full disclosure. Uh, earlier I had done an episode on Mortal Kombat. Okay. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. A friend of mine gave me some edibles and I took them and this did not reflect in my review or my opinion of the 2021 release of Mortal Kombat. So I go to this theater. It's an RPX theater, which is basically a large screen format. Uh, akin to IMAX, it's laser projection, Dolby surround, it's crazy. There was probably about 10, 12 people in the theater. It was opening day. Thanks Warner Brothers slash HBO Max for nothing, for not sending me a screener, for not sending me to... I'll, I'll, You know what? I'll forgive you guys right now. This is a whole Warner Brothers family. I'll forgive you for not sending me anything because there was a pandemic. It was like one of the first... Godzilla vs. Kong was my first movie back. And then it was I got to see nobody. And then I saw Mortal Kombat. This so was my third film back into the uh, theater ecosphere. I was violently high. <laughs> I was violently and abusively high during Mortal Kombat. So much to a degree that at a certain point during the film, I think it was right around when Goro showed up, I, there was nobody in the theater. I mean, it's Mortal Kombat. Nobody cared. People were still not going to the theaters. So I decided I'm going to stretch out. And it's, it's bad enough that you're in a theater where the seats recline. Excuse me. <laughs> it's those pickles from Pickle Island. They're so good. Guys, look. Pickle Island. Bayville, New York. That's all I'm saying. I'm going to leave it at that. It's so good. Oh, my God. The Cajun sweet. That's all I can talk about. So I go to see this film. I take the edibles. And I am bugging out. Okay, I am freaking out. I've seen Goro. Goro is scaring me. I don't know what's happening. There's kind of a stretch in this film where nothing is happening because it wasn't that good of a film. So I, I find myself laying across the aisle of seats. I don't know what's happening. I took my shoes off. I felt like a scared child. I, <laughs> my parents had left me home alone. I was 
I was so fucking violently high. And um, I'm laying across the seats. I got my shoes off. I don't know what I'm doing. I have my hood up and my hoodie because I'm in this whole row by myself. And, and it's like it's the aisles are staggered. So that you're kind of in your own little box area. So this dude, unfortunately, who just, I guess, went to the restroom and didn't realize he was coming to the wrong row, saw me. And I was like, oh, I was so scared. I was like, I was like, who are you? And he's, he's like, oh, sorry, wrong row. Now, this was absolutely terrifying to me and to him because I'm a grown man uh, without shoes, in a fetal position, laying across the seats in Mortal Kombat. I don't know what the fuck he thought. He might have thought that I was pulling a Paul Rubens and I'm just jerking my gherkin in the theater. He doesn't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. So the the takeaway for this, folks, my advice is if you're going to take edibles and you've never taken them before, okay, not everything needs to be a life-altering 2001, a space odyssey. You, you know, you don't want to be that high. So here's what I'm going to recommend, folks. When you're at home, take some of the edibles, take a little bit, see how you feel, see how you roll with it, and then decide how much you're going to do. And, and another thing, too, is sometimes you don't want to take public transportation, <laughs> There's nothing worse than being on a subway or a bus or a train you're tripping out. Maybe if you're going to take edibles, this is the time that you spring for an Uber or a Lyft. You know, you, you get yourself driven to the theater. Because I was so high, and, and, and I didn't even want to tell people this. It's so embarrassing. Even after the movie was over and I was completely underwhelmed because Mortal Kombat is the ultimate cock tease of a film, uh, I got to watch it again. I'm going to give it a second viewing. Maybe that'll change it. Maybe it won't. I don't know. I then went to my car in the parking lot and I listened to a bunch of podcasts because it was the only thing that could soothe me and lull me back into the the world. I was listening to uh, my good friends over at We Hate Movies and Talking Simpsons. They were doing their, their crossover episode and uh, it was able to kind of relax me enough to get back into the world and drive my car home from the ultimately sad and pathetic experience of being a grown man and seeing a matinee on a weekday of Mortal Kombat. So that's kind of the takeaway. The takeaway is with edibles, you, you don't want to be violently high. You want to make sure that you've taken just enough, but kind of know your limits and always do it safely and responsibly. Look, I, I, I don't want to be the guy. I don't want to be like the guy who's like, oh, you know, but like, look, I feel as I'm getting older now and stuff like I have to like, I got to drop this knowledge maybe on some of my peers, maybe on people who are younger than me, maybe some of you that are older and y'all motherfuckers should know better because you, your old ass is going and doing edibles. What are you doing? You're 70 years old. You got an AARP discount to go to the theaters and you're violently high. The fuck is that? Get ready for that shit. Because now, even in New York, where marijuana has been decriminalized and it's legal, people think, oh, I'm going to have to worry about all those kids. They're going to be... No, you're going to have to worry about old people. There's going to be people that are old, they're going to be stealing your popcorn. Um, you don't know. It could be your aunt. You have no fucking idea. But uh, yeah, that, that's the takeaway, folks. Make sure you know what you're doing. This week on The Offering, we've got something really good for you. It is G.I. Joe versus Masters of the Universe. This is a classic episode. I think you're going to like it a lot. So hang in there, uh, sober up, and get ready, because we're about to, I don't know, what's the catchphrase? Yo, Joe? Who knows? All right. All right. I'm done. I'm done. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Offering, and my name is Jerry Hara. I hope that everything finds you well, uh, that you're doing well and everything in your life is working out and you're happy. You know, it's important to be happy. People, you know, they're like, oh, blah, 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 blah. you know, you should be happy. You should. Nostalgia is a hell of a drug. It is probably one of the only commodities left as far as we know why intellectual properties are bought and sold the way they are. Intellectual properties have become the chief export of all media, whether it's television or film or video games. What do you got that people know? Show me something that everyone knows, and that's what we want to do. Because an original idea is, it's a gamble. It's a gamble. People are not willing to gamble. They'd rather sell you something they know that you're going to like. And that brings us to this week's offering. G.I. Joe 
versus Masters of the Universe. Now, I could have gone back and done a ridiculous amount of research, but I don't think that's what this episode is really about. As much research as I did do, I kept saying to myself, well, this is really about a time and place, and it's hard to kind of explain the 80s and the phenomenon of both properties. Right now, maybe even as you're listening to this, maybe after you're listening to this, I don't know what you're doing. I can't keep track of your shit. I can't keep track of my shit, so I don't know what you're doing. We have a Snake Eyes movie, and we have a brand new Masters of the Universe, Revelations. It's animated. Two movies, you know? two. Bro- well, one's a TV show, whatever. It's basically two. It's whatever it is. It's, it's a movie. It's a TV show. It's streaming. Who knows? Who cares? It's all content, because at the end of the day, isn't that what this all is? Even what you're listening to, this is content. It's all just content. And as long as we keep feeding the consumer, well, yeah. Speaking of being a consumer, in the 1980s, it was very commonplace and new to market towards children. I was a part of that very first generation that was so heavily marketed to. And that brings us to the beginning of this week's episode. A tale of two Uncle Bobs. When I was a kid, I had a bunch of Uncle Bobs. So I'm protecting the innocent. And it's true, I do. I got a bunch of Uncle Bobs. So I'm not going to tell you which Uncle Bob was which or whatever. But for the purpose of the story, it's a tale of two Uncle Bobs. I was playing with my Masters of the Universe, my He-Man figure. My Uncle Bob was telling me how great he-Man is, because my Uncle Bob valued bodybuilding and the physique of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And it was no secret that Masters of the Universe was very much modeled after Conan the Barbarian, especially if you see the, the toys that made us, a uh, fantastic show on Netflix. They explain the early genesis of He-Man and how it came from the whole Barbarian thing. It's no secret that Conan the Barbarian was an incredibly popular film, The problem was its rights were tied up in various different countries. It it was just a nightmare. So, I mean, Marvel had the comic. Plus, after the the Conan the Barbarian film in 1982, the Dino De Laurentiis joint, it was violent. It was horrific. There was no way, you know, like, how are you going to basically sell that to kids? Well, I think He-Man was adapted and cut from that same Conan cloth. So one Uncle Bob really valued the physique of He-Man. And he's like, he's powerful, blah, 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 blah. My other Uncle Bob, playing with a G.I. Joe. The other Uncle Bob explained to me that G.I. Joe is in the military. And and he has skills. And he's clearly focused. And he has machinery and weapons. It almost kind of borders a little more on the science fiction aspect of militaristic operations. Which, hey, we're here. It's 2021. And... Yeah, we use technology and weapons. I think what I'm trying to say is that both Uncle Bob's saw the value of each one of those. And I think that based on your play pattern, as they call it, um, one would appeal over the other. The problem for me as a kid was that we were the first group of children that were being so heavily catered to. When you put children's television on animated series they basically said okay you can put this on but you have to have something some kind of morality tale and at the end of masters of the universe it was kind of like a more mental health type thing orko would come out like you should be nice to people and then i think gi joe had the better ones like the psa is like the knowing the half is half the battle you know which eventually got parodied by the internet with all those those funny ones they did uh in the early aughts It's kind of like, you know, the G.I. Joe PSAs. And they would tell you, like, oh, you got to put out your campfire. Otherwise, you fucking burn down the forest. And you don't want that to happen. So as long as they did this, as long as they put some kind of nutritional value into these cartoons, they were able to make cartoons that were largely uh, catered to a certain demographic and audience. And this was basically all based on the fact of selling toys. And we would see tons of them. There were glow worms. There was Rainbow Bright. There was Mask. There's just like, there was Brave Star. 
There were so many crazy things, but the two biggest juggernauts of the 80s and still the most influential, G.I. Joe and Masters of the Universe. Yo, Joe! We'll fight for freedom wherever there's trouble. G.I. Joe is there. G.I. Joe is an American hero. G.I. Joe is there. G.I. Joe against Cobra and Destro, fighting to save the day. He never gives up, he's always there, fighting for freedom over land and air. G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe is there. G.I. Joe is the code name for America's daring, highly trained special mission force. Its purpose, to defend human freedom against Cobra, a ruthless terrorist organization determined to rule the world. He never gives up, he'll stay till the fight's won. G.I. Joe will dare. G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe is owned by Hasbro. Uh, they had brought back the figures in 1982. And they were like the three and three quarter figures. Gone was the 12 inch G.I. Joe with Kung Fu grip of the 1970s. Uh, in came the smaller G.I. Joe that had more accessories and more play value. It was more articulated. I always liked G.I. Joe because the figures were far more articulated and you could do cool things. They could do splits. They could kick people in the face. They were very flexible. Masters of the Universe followed suit like a year later. And the Masters of the Universe! I am Adam, Prince of Eternia and defender of the secrets of Castle Grayskull. This is Cringer, my fearless friend. Fabulous secret powers were revealed to me the day I held aloft my magic sword and said, By the power of Grayskull! became the mighty battle cat and I became He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. Only three others share this secret. Our friends, the Sorceress, Man-at-Arms, and Orko. Together we defend Castle Grayskull from the evil forces of Skeletor. That was catering to a whole different ball game. Mattel was like, hey, look, G.I. Joe is back. And we got we to gotta step our game up. And this Masters of the Universe thing had been so long gestating. You know, there, there were so many false starts. How do we market this? What's the initial wave of figures going to look like? And, of course, a lot of this is predicated on having an animated show that's going to sell your toys. So you have to make sure that your toys are flush with what's happening in the episodes. And uh, there had to be pretty much a marketing plan, especially with Masters of the Universe. Like, okay, if we're going to introduce Kubla Khan or Fisto, we have to make sure that the figure is going to be out. And that kind of schedule, especially like nowadays, you could probably do it a lot, you know, a lot easier. Like now they're able to do all these Marvel things. And it's like, uh, you know, WandaVision comes out. And the next week, you've already got Funko Pops, you got toys, you got pajamas. It wasn't so easy to do that in the 80s. We hadn't really entered the uh, easy ability to replicate toys. Now with like 3D printing, it's you can do it so quickly. They just make these toys. You know, back then it was still all done the old-fashioned way. Injection molding and that sort of thing. It's pretty crazy because G.I. Joe started as a five-episode miniseries. And they were like, all right, if it does well, we'll make this work. And what's crazy is at that time, that was Marvel. Marvel made the G.I. Joe series. They were the animators. They obviously had Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Had a lot of quality titles in the 80s. Uh, that, that was when they were still doing pretty good before they had to sell their company to Toy Biz. <laughs> that happens later in the 90s. We'll get there. But uh, yeah, G.I. Joe... Starts out with five episodes. And Marvel says, you know, we'll do a comic. And the comic started to get its a life of its own. So now it's like, oh, wow, we've got a comic book. We've got a TV show. It gets picked up to series. 
And then Masters of the Universe, the next year, kind of follows suit. They had their own comic book, their own cartoon, and uh, it became kind of a war for supremacy of the toy aisle. G.I. Joe sold very well because the figures were smaller and they were at a lower price point. The way they got you was with the vehicles. And Jesus Christ, did they have vehicles. When I was a kid, one of the greatest things that I ever got was, um, was the Terra Dome, which was the G.I. Joe, well, excuse me, it was Cobra, the enemy. Uh, it was Cobra's big hideout and it had a, a big jet in the middle of it. It was really cool. But because I was a spoiled kid, I also had Castle Grayskull. And I always felt like these two franchises were vying for my attention, okay? And depending on what week it was or what day it was or what I watched or if I got a G.I. Joe comic book, I was more into G.I. Joe that day. But who knows? Maybe I had a Beast Man figure that I just got from my grandmother. So now I was back on the He-Man bandwagon. And that was the thing with the scaled figures because they weren't in scale. Like He-Man was these big hulking creatures and people. Didn't really fit with the scale of G.I. Joe. They were tiny. Um, I noticed from my own play patterns as a kid, when I was younger, I loved He-Man a lot more. And as I got older, I appreciated G.I. Joe more. Because I think G.I. Joe started bringing something different to the table. And it also felt a little more serious. Um, they say you can never go home and sometimes revisiting certain things should be left in the past. I've gone back and I've watched the filmation masters of the universe TV show. And I can tell you, you can watch one or two episodes and you're done because they, it has not aged gracefully. I go back and I watch on GI Joe. There's a YouTube channel that uh, Hasbro GI Joe has, and they show the episodes and they do like live episodes, like, you know, top 10 episodes and those have aged surprisingly well and are totally watchable. However, if you see a woman, <laughs> generally it's Baroness in disguise trying to set up the G.I. Joes. That's the common thread in the G.I. Joe cartoon is that every woman is basically the Baroness in disguise. So if you're a G.I. Joe and you're out there and you see a woman and she needs her, she's waving for help for the car. Do not stop. Just keep going because it's the Baroness and she's going to trick you. And Destro is going to come out of a bush and fucking butt fuck you. And that's the way it's going to go. I'm sorry, but it, it got so dirty. It always gets dirty. Come on. Who are we kidding? This is, this is the episode that breaks the bank. Um, yeah. GI Joe was just, it was just so much more to it. I think what lured me in was the ninjas. I'm a su it was the 80s. We were all suckers for ninjas. We had Sho Kusagi, uh, who was in Revenge of the Ninja. Started out as the bad guy. And then he did Revenge of the Ninja. He's the good guy. Then we had Ninja 3, The Domination. It was about a woman getting possessed by an ancient ninja. It was weird. But I like it. It's a, it's a great film. Um, it's, a, it's a hybrid of sorts. But Ninja Mania was everywhere. I mean, ninjas were just so big. It was like you could send away and get throwing stars at your local flea market. There were karate magazines, you know, covering the secrets of the ninja. You could send away for books. Um, there was even a, oh, God. There was a series on NBC called The Master with Lee Van Cleef. Yeah, it's an, another white guy playing a ninja master. And... uh Essentially, Ninja Mania had taken over, and that's kind of what brought me to the table because when I was a kid, I had an older cousin who had kind of grown out of the G.I. Joe thing, like, rather quickly. And I think it was one of those things where people were still buying him stuff, so he was like, all right, you can have it because I'm not into this because I'm into Mike Tyson and cool stuff and Spuds McKenzie and boobs. And, yeah, I'm a teenager now. So I got all his G.I. Joes, like his hand-me-downs, which was, like, amazing and he had all the ninjas. He had Storm Shadow. He had Snake Eyes. So I was I was pretty well indoctrinated through that. And then I was reading the comic book as a kid. And I picked up the Larry Hama issue that was about Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow. And there was no words. It was all just pictures because uh, it was just silent. It was a silent issue and that had never been done. And it was really a testament uh, to all the artists and the writers like there was de they were definitely cooking more with gas. Like, G.I. Joe had more to say. I love He-Man. I think He-Man is great. But He-Man is more predicated 
on consumerism. It's basically a product that is designed to sell, you know? I'm not saying that G.I. Joe wasn't, but I don't know how pure the intentions of Masters of the Universe was. Uh, I think that a lot of the decisions that were made, like one of the decisions in the cartoon, like He-Man has a sword and a shield, and basically the parents group was like, no, you you can't show him using the sword. So if you watch He-Man again, you realize he doesn't do much with that sword. But as play pattern dictate and tell us, I have the power. And little boys like to run around with a sword and yell, I have the power. I mean, I want to go do it right now, now that I said it. I mean, I think He-Man is is a very more rudimentary show for kids to kind of learn the basics of good and evil and uh, problem solving and teamwork. Whereas I feel G.I. Joe was a little more mature and, and telling crazy stories. And just like any war, you have to... It's, it's all about escalation. So as He-Man went on, the toys got crazier. Like there was Moss Man. I love Moss Man. He smelled like moss and <laughs> he smelled like the woods. And he, he, had, he was covered. Um, I forget what they call that in the toy industry. But uh, he, he, was, he had this kind of fabric stuff on him. And uh, he, w- he was able to hide in the moss. You know, it, it, let me tell you something. The commercials for Masters of the Universe, they would show you these things like they because Moss Man was paired. Everything was like if you had a good guy that did something like there was Jitsu as to Fisto, like Fisto had a big fist. Jitsu had a big chopping, like karate chopping hand. Um, Moss Man was uh, flocked. That's what the terminology is. When you have a toy that has some kind of stuff, it's called flocked. Uh, Moss Man had Stinkor, and Stinkor smelled shitty, and he was a he was a skunk. So it was kind of like this weird dichotomy of like, okay, well, if you have a yin, you gotta have a yang. You have to have a good character and a bad character, just like you've got Battle Cat, and then you have Panthor, and Panthor is just it's the same toy. One is just painted black and flocked with the velvet like material. I think I, I rubbed Panthor on my dick at least when I'm kidding. <laughs> At once as a kid, I was like, is this, is this what a vagina feels like? And I wouldn't know. I would never know for another 35 years. Uh, I'm still a virgin. <laughs> After all these years, I still haven't been with a woman. Who, who knew? A guy talking about fucking snake eyes and, and panthor. You know, oh, I, I'm not good with the ladies. Oh, well, probably not. Um, yeah, they tried. Everything was was based on the spinoffs and escalation. So the toys got crazier on both sides. Um, You know, they added more mechanized parts. Uh, The toys became more intricate, more detailed. Um, Both TV shows are doing very well. They're both in syndication. So we've got to up the ante. And uh, Marvel Films had done work uh, with Japanese company Takara to make the Transformers. And they put out Transformers the movie. So Transformers the movie kind of beat everything else into theaters. The problem with Transformers the movie was they killed a lot of their characters. And the reason they killed those characters was so they could make new toys. Because that's what it's really all about. What they didn't count on was how traumatizing this would be to kids. That you kill Optimus Prime. You kill all these beloved characters. So at the same time, G.I. Joe was in production and they were going to kill Duke. And they were like, ooh, wait a second. Transformers didn't do very well. So the way that we all saw G.I. Joe the movie was they divided it again into five parts throughout the course of a week. And you had had big stars. You had Burgess Meredith. You had uh, Don Johnson. There was a lot of big stars attached to the G.I. Joe film. The problem with the G.I. Joe film was that it was like super violent. They had to change it. And then we introduced Cobra La, which were these half insect creatures from inside the earth. It's funky. It's weird. I love G.I. Joe the movie. It's it's still one of my favorites. It's a bizarre film. And G.I. Joe tried things like when they introduced Sergeant Slaughter, who was a WWF wrestler at the time. 
They introduce uh, the fridge. Perry, I forget what the hell his name was. Yeah, they keep uh, introducing all these outside characters. At one point, they wanted to uh, do Rocky Balboa, and they wanted to have Rocky be like an honorary G.I. Joe. They ended up not doing that, and they retrofitted um, the figure. They, they designed the whole figure and everything, and they like, just made another character with a mask. So then by the time Rambo hit, they were like, hey, Sylvester Stallone, would you like, maybe we'll put Rambo in G.I. Joe, because, like, um, you know, obviously... the we're, we're sorry about it, but that the Rocky thing didn't work out. And he was like, no, I'm going to go sell my own toys to Galoop. So he goes and he sells Rambo, Force of Freedom, because the 80s were so crazy that a super hyper violent character that was a mentally and emotionally damaged uh, Vietnam veteran. Yeah, like, fuck it. You're going to have your own toy line. It was very much the Oprah way of, it was like, it was like, you get a toy line. Oh, you got RoboCop? It's an ultra-violent R-rated film? Here you go. Here's a cartoon and a toy line from Kenner. What, Police Academy? Oh, yeah, here's a toy line and a cartoon. You don't realize until you're older how much stuff that was completely inappropriate for kids. I still lament the fact that there was a Fox Kids TV show that was based on aliens um, that we never got. And I feel like that's truly a missed opportunity. Because the Aliens toys, another Kenner thing, was, they were great. Uh, back, though, to Masters of the Universe and G.I. Joe world, this G.I. Joe, the movie, was not going to be released in theaters. So it was going to be released with an aggressive uh, home video release and then putting it on TV for five epi episodes and then basically packaging it. And it was very smart. Because they realized, okay, we're not going to sell tickets to this movie, but we're basically implanting all the new toys that are going to be available. So they, they kind of looked at it not just as a movie, because they spent some more money on the animation, like overall. Now, what swept me off my feet was when they introduced Shira, who was He-Man's sister. Not according to my figures. They definitely slept together. But, uh, and, and you know what? With all the porn that's popular now, brother, sister, who's to say? Shira's head got stuck in an oven. Oh, no. How did this happen again? Uh, Secret of the Sword. My mom took me to go see Secret of the Sword. And bless her soul, because I don't know how anybody sat through that terrible. I mean, I loved it as a kid. I thought it was the greatest thing. I was like, oh, this is great. Oh, yeah. But I only had Shira. I didn't buy the other dolls because they had real rooted hair. And that didn't really appeal to me as a boy. Uh, they had a Pegasus. They had some cool characters. It just, it was one of those things. It was a different time and you just, you didn't play with girls toys. Um, and for the most part, there really weren't many women in the GI Joe world. You know, you had, you had basically early on, you had a lot of those characters like, like Baroness and whatnot, but Lady J, they really, the female characters never took off and, Mattel up the ante because they were like, oh, you know what? He-Man worked. Let's make He-Man with a vagina. That'll work. Like, let's do it. Okay. It was not as successful. It had its fans. I think, to be honest with you, looking back now, the Shira Princess of Power line of toys is probably one of my favorites um, because I didn't have them. Um, and they're just well-designed, very creatively thought out toys that are well made and uh, they're different enough from He-Man to create their own little pocket universe where they had their own villain, uh, the evil Hordak. We'll be right back with more of The Offering with Jerry Horror. You're listening to The Offering with Jerry Horror. Got a question or a story you want to share with me? It might be featured in a future episode. Email me at jerryhara at gmail.com or hit me up on Twitter at jerryhara. I'm also on Instagram. You can find me there at jerryhara. Rate and review this show on Apple Podcasts and you might find your review in an upcoming episode. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to The Offering. Now back to the show. So The Secret of the Sword comes out. It doesn't do that well. And we're, we're, we're dealing, again, with escalation. So they're trying to sell a G.I. Joe movie. Well, <laughs> they kept trying to sell it, and it just it didn't work out. Now, you know, like, 
that would be an easy thing to do, but in the 80s, it wasn't. So eventually what happened was uh, Golan Globus, the, the, my, my friends from Israel, the, the Canon uh, Films people, they kept seeing their kids. They're like, oh, man, they love G.I. Joe. They love G.I. Joe. So they made the movie American Ninja with Michael Dudikoff is pretty much an amalgam. Um, Golan, <laughs> Golan and Globus' children telling them about G.I. Joe and like they're writing it down like there is a ninja. They're like, so basically it's funny because if you watch the movie American Ninja and again, the ninja craze, we all love ninjas and it's the old trope and it was the same thing with Snake Eyes where it's a white guy who is left on a mysterious island, it's just like Beverly Hills Ninja, just like Bloodsport, just like everything else that came out of the 80s. It's always some dopey white guy who gets adopted by Japanese people and he learns martial arts and blah, 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 blah. It's a trope. We've, we've seen it so many times. Um, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Like, you know, American Ninja works, though. But I just think it's funny that it was a movie that was made by two producers that were told by their children about G.I. Joe. And they basically were like, we don't have the money for G.I. Joe. We make our own G.I. Joe, American Ninja. See, he is American. He's ninjas, just like G.I. Joe. We have G.I. Joe at home. Uh, really, this is one of those things where both toy lines are doing very well. So G.I. Joe couldn't get the movie off the ground. But the, the Masters of the Universe line, Shira didn't work out. And now there is a dwindling, uh, it's it just, it's not working. It's, it, you know, like the toys aren't selling, the accessories aren't selling. Kids move on. You know how it goes. We're on to the next thing. Even Mattel, like they were developing Captain Power and all these other things. They were trying, they were on to the next thing. So wouldn't you know, but those fine folks at Canon they got the rights to Masters of the Universe. And uh, it was the quickest film that ever came out in August and was on, on home video by October. It was the quickest turnaround. Um, Masters of the Universe is not a good film. It, it features the debut of Courtney Cox, you know, the famous girl from the Bruce Springsteen video. Uh, and hey, it's the guy who was the bodyguard. He played the bodyguard to Grace Jones, uh, and he was also dating Grace Jones, and they made him He-Man. His name's Dolph Lundgren, and we all grew up with Dolph Lundgren. We love him, and uh, it was funny because there was a story about Sylvester Stallone coming onto the set the day they were shooting Masters of the Universe, and he's like, he was like, yo, you, you hired this guy to be the lead? And he's like, he's like, yeah, and the year before, he had he had been in Rocky IV, and he's like, you know this guy can't act, right? He's not a very good actor. He's got physical presence, but he can't. And it's just funny because they they were friends and he was basically just joshing them. But he I know Stallone to believe that he's like, you know, so, yeah, uh, there's a lot of things that do and don't work about the Masters of the Universe film. I love Frank Langella. He is just he did. The, he did it. He's Skeletor. He did the movie because his kids absolutely adored it. And he's like, all right, I'm going to take one for the team. I'm going to make a movie for my kids. It's like Raul Julia with the Street Fighter. And uh, Frank Langella is great. I like it. I love his performance. It's hammy. It's pitch perfect. He knows exactly what movie he's in. Uh, it's not a very good film. We, <laughs> there's no Orko. There's a lot of things that aren't in this Masters of the Universe movie. Um, there's no Battle Cat. Where's Battle Cat? We can't afford Battle Cat. Okay. What about... We can't afford that either. And that becomes the story of Masters of the Universe because it's not Masters of the Universe made by 20th Century Fox. It's Canon Films Masters of the Universe. Yes, the same people who brought you same year. Uh, it, Masters of the Universe may or may not be part of the reason uh, that Canon Films... It was Canon basically wrote checks that they couldn't cash. You know, They bought the rights to Superman 4. How did they get the rights to Superman? Well, they put together a trailer and it was all the footage from the first three movies. And they're like, yeah, we're making a new one. And yeah, that's kind of how that got made. So they spent a lot of money on Superman. They, they gave uh, Stallone $10 million, which is like the highest amount of money anybody had ever gotten. He, he got that for over the top. 
the arm wrestling movie, which also had toys, but also didn't make arm wrestling. <laughs> they were like, he is Sylvester Stallone. He will make movie number one. If he is boxer, they love him. Whatever he do, he is war guy. They love him. Well, they did not love arm wrestling. I can attest to you. I didn't have any, any of the toys. They didn't sell. There is no over-the-top video game. It just, it, it didn't, you know, like there's no over-the-top uh, franchise where there's like four of them. Even though that would kind of be interesting now that I'm thinking about it. Also, you know what would have made a really great toy line? Roadhouse. Like, they had Roadhouse toys and Patrick Swayze and... I mean, they had a Karate Kid animated series. Basically everything. Nothing was off the table. Eventually, even the Toxic Avenger became the Toxic Crusader. Like, everything was adapted. Masters of the Universe did not make money. And the worst part about Masters of the Universe is that they initially had promised them, I think, a $25 million budget, which, like, turned into, like, an $8 million <laughs> budget. And uh, they, they really only, like, they had... They basically built this gigantic set and they spent all their money and they're like, oh, we're going to build, you know, the throne room on Eternia and, uh, you know, we're going to build more big sets like this. It's going to be grandiose. And then, of course, the guys at Canon are like, well, OK, <laughs> like so this whole movie is supposed to take place on Eternia. Well, we don't have money for Eternia. So it take place. It, kids know the real world. So we make Masters of the Universe. <laughs> So you've got He-Man running around some Midwestern town. It's terrible. It's just, even though, I, like, Masters of the Universe is one of those things that I get really stoned. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to turn this on. This thing's awesome. And then, like, ten minutes in, I'm like, oh, god damn it. I know why this is terrible. Even though, again, there is there is a soft spot in my heart for the movie. And I remember, like, my mom, there was another one, like, my poor mother, my poor, poor mother took me to go see that. And uh, it was out on, like, VHS so quickly. There had never been a turnaround like that. But they were, like, they had spent all the money to produce it. So they were, like, the advertising's out there in the ether. And it came out in October after, like, an August 16th release. And that was, like, oh, my God. And now it's, like, you look at everything that's going on with the streaming where it's, like, we just had A Quiet Place 2 came out. 45 days, day and date from release date, it'll be on streaming, on Blu-ray. So the theatrical window has gotten smaller and smaller. So Masters of the Universe were way ahead of their time with that. Uh, eventually, it's it kind of it kind of sucks because both of these series start dwindling down. There really is nowhere to go with He-Man. Unfortunately, for better or worse, they'd done about everything they could. Um, sadly, towards the end, we got some of the best toys, though. We had the Eternia play set. Um, we had the aforementioned movie release toys, which were kind of stupid, but I enjoyed them. They made all these weird toys towards the end. They were doing the giants, uh, these gigantic creatures that never came out here, the rock lords, the, the transforming rock people, Modulok which was a creature that could be reshaped and taken apart and put together whichever way your creative instinct leads you. Uh, G.I. Joe just got weirder. G.I. Joe, just like at a certain point, uh, they just started getting way too sci-fi. Once they introduced Cobra Law and that whole uh, part of the mythology, it just got really like, okay, here's monsters. Okay, now they're astronauts. Now there's aliens. Like... And it was like, ooh, it just jumped the shark. They couldn't really do anything with Masters of the Universe. And it pretty much was going to die a, a, a slow, painful death. Uh, the toys, the TV show it was not picked up anymore. The Filmation series was over. Eventually, the G.I. Joe cartoon ended. Um, they kept G.I. Joe around longer. It outlived Masters of the Universe, but not by much. And they started co-opting different things. They were like, oh, we can make Street Fighter toys. We'll just make them with the G.I. Joe molds. They tried a lot of different things, especially internationally, to repackage, resell these G.I. Joes as something else or a new line. Uh, it really didn't work. We would see G.I. Joe come back a couple of times, but it never stuck. He-Man would come back, the new adventures of He-Man, where He-Man had more of a, not a Schwarzenegger body, but more of a Jean-Claude Van Damme body. And he also had a ponytail and a day-glow weird sword. It was bad. It didn't work. 
the animation was done by a European company, and the new adventures of He-Man, no matter how hard they tried, it just wouldn't come back. They even tried, uh, at a certain point, they did G.I. Joe Sigma-6. It, it didn't work. They were like, okay, well, G.I. Hasbro panicked a bunch of times. They were like, let's bring back the 12-inch line. Okay, that didn't work. Let's let's make six inch figure. Yeah, six inch. So they tried everything. They tried every which way. Eventually, both of these series died in the two thousands. After the nineties were not kind to either of these brands. Once you get into the mid nineties and beyond, it, it's they're both pretty much dead. They're they're you know there's nothing left. In the early two thousands, oh boy, it gets crazy because you have. The, these new adventures of He-Man and the animation is done really well. Um, you have the Four Horsemen, which is a design studio, and they're doing just brilliant work. And now these toys start to develop a life of their own. And collectors, they start the Maddie Collector Group over at Mattel, and that's all the special figures, and people start collecting those. Then they do the filmation figures, which are based on the animation. So they find that they are not able to relaunch He-Man with a young audience, but they can sell the nostalgia wholesale to the collectors that are like my age. G.I. Joe tried to get there, but they didn't. And then most recently, I want to say about a year or two ago, they decided that, okay, we're going to make six-inch figures that are kind of based on the three and three-quarter We're going to bring back all of your favorites, Roadblock, Snake Eyes, the whole shebang. And they're selling like gangbusters. They're doing fantastic. Masters of the Universe is back. They do a retro line. And and it's people are collecting them. Here's the thing, though. And this this is ultimately the problem. These toys are, they can say whatever they want to say. Okay, we can talk to a blue in the face. These toys are not aimed at children. They are aimed at adult collectors. I know plenty of fathers. One of my friends I just talked to the other day, and he's like, yeah, he's like, I, I was buying all the Masters of the Universe. And I'm like, well, is, is your son into them? And he's like, no, I, I tried. So you have like these people who are buying things like my age that are nostalgic for G.I. Joe. They're nostalgic for He-Man. But they're buying them and they're saying like under the... the <laughs> <laughs> under the the guise of, yeah, I'm trying to get barely into them. No, you're not. Like, you're collecting them for yourself, and that's ultimately what's happening. They tried a lot of different things. We had a G.I. Joe movie uh, in the early 2000s. <sighs> they, you know, it, it was not very good. Channing Tatum, Dennis Quaid, Marlon Wayans. It was really kind of out there and goofy. And then they did G.I. Joe Retaliation, which I thought was better. Uh, you brought in The Rock at that point, you know, and then Bruce Willis played Joe, G.I. Joe. Uh, and then, like, yeah, the movie made money. I mean, it did well in theaters. It's just like, you know, The Rock was like, yeah, I'm franchise Viagra. You put me in the fast movie, I make the fast movie blow up. Put me in G.I. And he's he got kind of a point. He's right place, right time, but I don't believe that at all. Uh, Ray Park played Snake Eyes. We never see who's under Snake Eyes. Byung Hoon Lee plays storm shadow um he came from a a k-pop the k-pop scene pretty much he was a a singer dancer um they were fine depictions of the characters it is what it is obviously the rock played roadblock um there were never really after retaliation though there were no sequels made it just kind of laid dormant um they brought back the toys they did a lot of collector stuff They brought back the three and three quarter inch uh, original toys that I grew up with in the 80s. They did not take. Now they brought back the three and three quarter again, plus the six inch ones that are based on the ones that I grew up with from the Marvel comics and the cartoon. And those are selling fantastically. As as I speak to you right now, we have the new Snake Eyes film that's coming out. Looks pretty good. We've got the new Masters of the Universe Revelations. It's like, <laughs> it sounds like, I don't know, like an erotic fragrance, Revelations. Um, that's by Kevin Smith. It's got Mark Hamill, Sarah Michelle Gellar. Uh, you know, you got Henry Golding in, in Samara Weaving in the G.I. Joe movie. So you've got a lot of really good talent. But I say to you, and I beg of you again, who is this for? Um, 
again, if you show snake eyes to a kid, you're like, oh, cool, ninjas. There's ninjas flipping and they're jumping off motors. I get it, okay? I understand how ninjas work. Um, the He-Man thing is kind of like, wait, so dad, you like this? Yeah. It's kind of gay. Like, I imagine this, this, this scenario, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's not homophobic or whatever. I mean gay is, and it's just terrible. Um, wait, that didn't sound good either. Everything I say is just terrible. Um, I, it's a sword. It's based on the sword and sandal thing. It comes from the Steve Reeves movies, Hercules, and the mythology. And I just don't know. Like, they're doing Revelations, and then supposedly Netflix is... They were working on a movie, um, and the movie that was going to be live action just for whatever reason didn't come to fruition because they couldn't reach a deal monetarily. And now there's something going on where Mattel is going to lose the rights and the, and the distribution rights go to Universal. So we're going to go in some very interesting territory with that because we're going to see if they're going to allow Mattel to do toys or if they're going to take the property and say, okay, well, we're Universal, we're going to relaunch it and... So Masters is kind of in a strange place. They have another cartoon they're developing for He-Man. There was a Shira cartoon that was on Netflix, which I heard was pretty good. The toys just didn't take. Like, they were able to get kids and young girls. They were able to get them invested into the Shira Princess of Power brand. And I heard the cartoon was great, but the toys didn't sell. And that's <laughs> ultimately at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. It's about selling toys. I don't know how relevant these toys are, but what I do know is there's a lot of adults collecting them, more people than you think. And sometimes, you know, you go to the movie theater or you walk to Target and you walk in and there's He-Man, there's G.I. Joe. What's changed? I don't know. Is it 84? Who knows what year it is? How long is it before they, before they remake American Ninja and over the top? I mean, nothing really ever goes out of style. Well, it does, but it comes back. I mean, I can't believe that in the short time that I've been alive, I've witnessed the birth and death and rebirth four or five times over of both franchises. I think they're both great. I can't say that I like one more than the other because I have an attachment to both. And ultimately, even though this was really about two titans of toys coming at each other, Mattel with He-Man, and on the other hand, Hasbro with G.I. Joe, and at the end of the day, that's what it was about. It, it was really, there was a, an energy in the 1980s with toy making where we had talking teddy bears like Teddy Ruxpin and glowing worms like Glow Worm, My Little Pony, Transformers, so many great and iconic toys created in the 80s because they allowed the creativity of the designers and the people making these toys, they let it flow. And they let them do whatever they wanted. They said, okay, it's blue sky, here's the canvas. What do you want to do with G.I. Joe? Okay, you're going to have ninjas and nobody's talking. Okay, we're going to do it. Fine, we'll do it. They, they took chances artistically and creatively. And that's why, to this day, this is why Masters of the Universe is popular. This is why G.I. Joe is popular. Because they let the creators off their leash and allowed them to do something that was original. I don't know. I, like I said, I've seen this rebirth so many times. Is Snake Eyes going to be a success? I don't know. It looks interesting to me, but I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm still that five-year-old kid, okay? It, there's ninjas. I'm going to go see it. I, I don't know any better. Uh, this new He-Man, the Masters of the Universe, uh, Revelations, of course. Kevin Smith is involved. We all love Kevin Smith. Mark Hamill is Skeletor. We're, of, everybody's in. We're all in. I'll give it a shot. I'll watch at least one episode. And if I don't dig it, it is what it is. Nothing will change the fact that if you grew up with these properties and you love them, nothing can take away the good memories and the nostalgia. And I told you, nostalgia is a hell of a drug. We're, we're, nostalgia is worth more money than diamonds and cocaine. Trust me. Please believe that. Nothing can ever take away that feeling of being a kid and just letting your imagination go. Well, where does Snake Eyes go? Wherever you want him to go. You're not beholden to the lore. You're not beholden to the cartoon or the comic. You can do whatever you want. And I think that is why these toys made such a big impression because they gave us a firm foundation 
of mythology and then said, you, now you make the stories. You decide how this is going to play out. Will good win? Will evil win? Who knows? Doesn't matter. It's up to you. And I think based on what we know of uh, young boys and the way that they play with things, that did not sound good either. But the, the play patterns of, of young men are that they like a male figure and they like to, they like kind of the power fantasy. And G.I. Joe and Masters of the Universe both appeal to that power fantasy. And nobody summed it up better than He-Man himself because he was a prince. But if he held up the sword and said, I have the power, he did. And that, that it, it sounds cheesy, but it's a very powerful message to young men is that I am the creator of this story. I am the author. I will decide, you know, how I win, how I conquer, how I divide, how I compete. Um, these toys taught us a wealth of things, but primarily to be a consumer. At the end of the day, people are still buying the toys. So I can't tell you what's changed, but man, Vince McMahon said it best, get them young. And that was exactly what he's done. And that's the trajectory that WWE continues to this day. Get them when they're kids, sow those seeds, because guess what? They'll grow up to be fat 40-year-old men, and they'll buy that same toy, that same T-shirt for their children or for themselves. Let's face it. That, that's what this is all about. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you think, but this is what I think. And if you want to get at me on social media, I'm at Jerry Hara. Tell me what's on your mind. Did you grow up a Masters of the Universe fan? Were you a G.I. Joe fan? Were you both? I liked both. I'm a dumb kid. I didn't know any better. That's at Jerry Hara on all social media. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode. Hope it gave you kind of a peek behind the curtain of what made our childhoods so magic. And uh, like I always say, don't go to sleep until you have something worth dreaming about. You've been listening to The Offering with Jerry Hara. I'm very sorry. Produced by Pete Pugh. If you have a question or a story you want to share with me, we'd love to hear from you. You can email me at jerryhara at gmail.com or hit us up at Twitter at Jerry Hara or on Instagram at Jerry Hara. You get in the picture? Subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are provided for you and your family. I want you to enjoy. Just join us next time for another offer. I'm Tom. My partner Mike and I have been friends and co-workers for a long time. And at work, we're known for our daily water cooler conversations about TV shows and movies we are currently watching. Whether we're arguing over which Marvel TV show is the best or agreeing about which Netflix original movie is the worst, the pop culture conversation is always popping on Two Brothers at a Water Cooler. You can listen to Two Brothers at a Water Cooler on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are available. Subscribe and share today. This has been a Sick Boy Wolfgang production. Thank you for listening.